welcome to iFormRx, where we explore the evidence that informs ambulatory care pharmacy practice. Today's discussion is regarding Lidipasivir and Sovosfuvir for previously treated hepatitis C genotype 1 infection, which appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine in April 2014. Leading this discussion is Rachel Coleman Drury, a PGY2 ambulatory care pharmacy practice resident at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. As pharmacists, we have all read these headlines and overheard conversations in hospital hallways or at pharmacy counters. Although the cost of the medications are staggering, $95,000 on average for a 12-week course of Lidipasphere Sovosfibir, or brand name Harvani, the advancement in treatment and the possible cure of hepatitis C has certainly been newsworthy. 3.2 million people in the United States have chronic hepatitis C infection, and an estimated 130 to 150 million people are infected with the virus worldwide. Before a person can be chronically infected, they must acquire acute hepatitis C. Risk factors for hepatitis C include intranasal or injection drug abuse, incarceration, receipt of a tattoo in an unregulated setting, long-term hemodialysis, HIV infection, and maternal transmission during childbirth. Those who receive a blood transfusion or organ transplantation before July of 1992 or treatment with clotting factor concentrate before 1987 are also at risk. Of those individuals with acute hepatitis C, 15 to 50 percent will spontaneously clear the infection within three to four months of acquiring the virus. The majority of patients, 50 to 85 percent, will progress to chronic infection. The progression of chronic hepatitis C differs among individuals, with 15 to 50 percent of patients experiencing further progression to cirrhosis of the liver. Roughly 5% of patients with liver cirrhosis will progress to either hepatocellular carcinoma or hepatic decompensation yearly. Both complications result in high rates of mortality. Before we review the hepatitis C guidelines, it is important to review the different genotypes of the virus. Hepatitis C genotypes have geographic distributions and are utilized to determine treatment. Genotype 1 has two subtypes, A and B, and represent the majority of the cases in the United States. Historically, genotype 1 infections have been the least likely to respond to therapy, but response rates have increased with the release of protease inhibitors. Genotype 2 and 3 represent roughly one quarter of the infections in the United States and respond well to therapy. Genotypes 4, 5, and 6 have been found in higher prevalence outside of North America, are less studied, and have variable response to therapy. I would like to draw your attention to abbreviations that you will find throughout this presentation. Sustained virologic response will be abbreviated as SVR and represents the absence of quantifiable hepatitis C virus RNA and serum, or less than 25 international units per milliliter. Additionally, throughout the presentation, medications have been abbreviated. LDV, SOF, will be used for Lidipasphere sulfosfavir, or brand name Harvani. And 3D will be utilized for paratapravir, ritonavir, ambitosphere, and desabuvir, or brand name Vicarapac. Of note, the guideline referenced in this presentation is a collaboration between the Infectious Disease Society of America, the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease, and the International Antiviral Society of the United States of America. These guidelines are currently housed at hcvguidelines.org to accommodate frequent changes as updates and new data become available. This presentation presents the guideline recommendations as of March of 2015. The goal of therapy is to reduce all-cause mortality and liver-related health adverse consequences by the achievement of continued absence of detectable hepatitis C virus RNA 
at least 12 weeks after completion of therapy. This is also known as sustained virologic response. The current guideline recommends four treatment options for treatment-naive patients with genotype 1 disease. The length of therapy is dictated by two factors. One, the genotype subtype of either A or B, and two, the presence or absence of cirrhosis. Lodiposphere sulfosfavir and paratepravir, ritonavir, ombidosphir, and dasabruvir based therapies have a class 1 level A recommendation, and semepravir sulfosfavir based therapy currently has a class 2A level B recommendation. Similar treatment options exist for genotype 1 patients who have failed previous treatment of pegulated interferon and ribavirin with or without a protease inhibitor. Similar to the therapies for treatment-naive patients, lidiposphere sulfosfavir and pertepravir ritonavir ombidosphere and dasubravir based therapies have a class 1 level A recommendation and semepravir sulfosfavir therapy currently has a class 2A level B recommendation. The level of evidence for using lidiposphere sulfosfavir with the addition of ribavirin however differs dependent upon previous treatment failure. Previous failure with pegulated interferon and ribavirin has a class 1 level B recommendation, and failure with pegulated interferon with ribavirin and a protease inhibitor has a class 2A level B recommendation. Now that we have reviewed the guidelines, let's look further into the ION2 trial, a pivotal study to determine the role of lidiposphere sulfosfavir with or without ribavirin in patients with genotype 1 infection who had previous treatment failure. This open-label trial was performed throughout multiple sites in the United States. It enrolled 440 patients who were 18 years of age or older with chronic hepatitis C genotype 1 infection. Patients were included if they failed to achieve a sustained virologic response with either pegulated interferon or an NS3-4 protease inhibitor with pegulated interferon and ribavirin. Patients were excluded if they had discontinued a prior therapy due to an adverse event. Patients were randomized 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 and stratified according to the presence or absence of cirrhosis and response to prior therapy. Patients received lidiposphere 90 mg and sulfosfavir 400 mg daily with or without weight-based ribavirin, which was dosed twice a day for either 12 or 24 weeks. The primary and secondary endpoints of the trial were to evaluate the rate of sustained virologic response at both 12 and 24 weeks post-treatment. Baseline characteristics were similar throughout all four treatment arms, with roughly two-thirds of the patients being male, over three-fourths identifying themselves as white, and with an average age of 56 years. Roughly 80% of the patients in the study had genotype 1A infection and had viral loads greater than or equal to 6 log 10 international units or a million copies per ml. Additionally, 20% of the patients had liver cirrhosis. Around 85% of the patients in the study had interleukin 28B gene polymorphisms of either CT or TT, which are historically known to have lower response rates to therapy. Additionally, roughly 50% of the patients in the study had previously received a protease inhibitor-based therapy, and approximately 55% of the patients suffered either relapse or virologic breakthrough. For all four treatment groups, the rate of sustained virologic response was superior to the adjusted historical response rate of 25% with a p-value of less than 0.001 for all comparisons. Overall, 11 of the 440 patients, about 2% of the patients in the study,
had a virologic relapse after the end of treatment. Seven of the relapsed patients were randomized to lidiposphere sulfosfavir, and the other four were randomized to lidiposphere sulfosfavir with ribavirin, all for 12 weeks of therapy. Ten of the 11 patients relapsed by week four of post-treatment therapy, and one patient relapsed between weeks four and 12 of post-treatment. No patients randomized to 24 weeks of therapy had virologic relapse. All patients who had sustained virologic response rates at 12 weeks post-therapy also had sustained virologic response rates at 24 weeks post-therapy. Two patients who were treated for 24 weeks did not have a sustained virologic response. One patient who received lidiposphere sulfosfavir withdrew consent after post-treatment week 4, at which time the patient's hepatitis C RNA level was undetectable. The other patient who received lidiposphere sulfosfavir with rivavirin had virologic rebound during treatment, which may have resulted from non-adherence as the patient had low to undetectable concentrations of the study medication at weeks 2, 4, and 6 of treatment. When evaluating sustained virologic response by subgroups, often more patients randomized to 24 weeks of therapy achieved a sustained virologic response in comparison to patients randomized to 12 weeks. This was especially true with patients who had either the 1A genotype or an interleukin 28B gene polymorphism of non-CC, both which have historically been difficult to treat. It is important to highlight that 100% of patients with cirrhosis who underwent 24 weeks of treatment had sustained virologic response. This is in comparison to roughly 84% of patients with cirrhosis who underwent 12 weeks of therapy. 67 to 90% of patients had an adverse event during the trial, however, most were mild to moderate in nature. Most commonly, patients experienced fatigue, headache, nausea, insomnia, arthralgia, and cough. The incidence rate of adverse events was often higher in those who were randomized to receive ribavirin. There were no serious adverse events in the 12-week arm of the study and roughly 5% of patients receiving treatment for 24 weeks experienced a serious event. No patients discontinued the study due to an adverse event. While this study provides strong evidence for the use of lidiposphere sulfosfavir in patients with hepatitis C genotype 1 infection who have failed previous therapy, the study results generate a number of questions for discussion. So in order to help us answer these questions, I'd like to introduce our expert panel for the roundtable discussion. Dr. Emily Heil is a clinical specialist at the University of Maryland Medical Center and is a board-certified pharmacotherapy specialist with additional qualifications in infectious disease and a practicing HIV pharmacist. And Dr. Brian Love is a clinical associate professor at the South Carolina College of Pharmacy USC campus and a board-certified pharmacotherapy specialist. To start the discussion, I am wondering what both of you see as the major strengths and weaknesses of this study. Are there any major threats to its internal validity or external generalizability? I think really the biggest strength of this study, in my opinion, is that they tackled what is really a notoriously difficult to treat population. So the study focused on genotype 1 patients who had not achieved a response with prior therapy, um, and also a decent amount of these patients, they included up to 20% of patients that did have cirrhosis. So this is really one of the hardest to treat populations, and up until this point, um, a group that we didn't really have a good answer or a lot of good outcomes for. Um, you could say that potentially the open-label study design could be an issue, but ethically, I'm not really sure how we could make this a blinded study, given that there wouldn't be a great comparator arm since treatment has been shown in some of the phase two studies to be so much better than what was already out there. 
In terms of the patient population that was included, it was, of course, primarily white males. But with these newer agents, we aren't seeing some of the racial differences in treatment outcomes related to genetic links, such as the IL-28B genotypes and interferon e efficacy that we saw with older therapies. So I think it still probably is very generalizable to most of the patients you would see that had previously failed therapy when you're considering Harvoni for treatment. I would just say that also, I mean, in terms of the size of the study, this is a pretty large study, about 450 patients overall, which is a pretty good size study for hepatitis C trial. I would also agree that, in general, some of the minorities and females may be a little bit underrepresented, but there have been no signals in any of the studies to date that really has demonstrated there's any lack of efficacy in any particular ethnic or minority group. The next question I want to explore with this study is that all cases of relapse actually occurred in patients who received treatment for 12 weeks in comparison to those who received treatment for 24 weeks. Given the expense and the potential risks, I'm sure we'd all agree that it's important to limit the treatment duration whenever possible. However, due to the results of this study, are there any subpopulations of patients with previously treated hepatitis C genotype 1 infection that should indeed receive extended therapy? So the authors did comment on this in the discussion section, commenting on some specific groups that experienced a lot of relapses. There were 11 total. It did appear that, that relapse was more common in, in those who did not receive ribavirin, seven out of the 11. More patients who were genotype 1A, eight out of the 11 patients were genotype 1A. Patients with cirrhosis represented seven of the 11. There were also some patients who had a baseline resistance to the ledeposphere component of the Harvoni, and those were about six out of the 11 patients. Also, prior PI treatment, the chance of relapse was increased, and then uh, prior null or non-response was also increased chance of, of relapse. Um, one other comment, there's a study that's currently in progress, and the results are not fully presented yet. It's called the Sirius study. And this study is a little bit different in that it was the 12-week uh, group was randomized and double-blinded and placebo-controlled. These patients were patients with cirrhosis and prior PI failure. The response rates were generally high in that study as well. It would appear that 12 weeks of treatment with lodeposphir, sofosbuvir, plus ribavirin is a very good option for, for most patients. I think the one patient population that jumps out just a little bit is the patients with cirrhosis. Um, patients with cirrhosis compared to patients without cirrhosis that only received 12 weeks of therapy did have significantly lower SVR12 rates than the patients who had a full 24 weeks of therapy. And interestingly enough, the FDA labeling of Harvoni does suggest using 24 weeks in patients with cirrhosis. So that would be a group where potentially you should consider extending out therapy. Interestingly enough, I recently read an interview with the lead author of the ION2 study, and he was asked the question whether or not patients with cirrhosis should be treated for 12 or 24 weeks. And he actually said that if you look at the pooled 200 cirrhotic patients amongst all three of the ION studies, only 4% of them relapsed. And he was quoted as saying, we would have to over-treat 9 out of 10 patients to get a benefit for extended treatment, which does not make clinical or fiscal sense to over-treat these patients. So I thought that was interesting because when you read the study, to me at least, it did seem like the differences in response rates for cirrhosis or no cirrhosis in the 12-week arm seemed clinically significant in my mind. So to see the lead author of the study actually say that potentially 12 weeks would be enough for anybody, I thought was an interesting observation. The next question I'd like to explore, if there are any subpopulations of patients with hepatitis C virus genotype 1 infection in whom you feel the Harvani treatment is not the best choice in terms of efficacy, safety, or cost, and if you do have a subgroup, what alternative therapies would you recommend for them? Quite honestly, at this point in time, if we're only talking about genotype 1 patients, the combination of lodipavir and sofosbuvir in the Harvoni pill um, truly is, in my mind, the best option that we have available right now for that patient population, just from the convenience aspect of it being 
one pill once a day, overall fairly safe side effect profile. Cost is certainly another issue that I'm sure we will continue to talk about a little bit, but um, in my mind, that is still our first go-to for these patients when we're seeing them in clinic. Um, I would say there are maybe occasions where some of the very few drug interactions you might see with Harvoni could be a consideration where you might want to consider other therapy, but unfortunately, some of the main alternatives like the Vicara pack usually are associated with even more drug interaction potential than Harvoni is. So quite honestly, I don't really have a lot of situations where I'm considering something else as the first line. But that being said, we know the pipeline is huge, so that might change in even a month or two, given how quickly this area of research is moving. Harvoni is certainly a very convenient option for a lot of patients. One pill once a day, it's hard to, um, to beat that. I think the one area in terms of safety where Harvoni is lacking in terms of data is in patients with renal in- insufficiency. And unfortunately for those patients, we really don't have any good options that are available currently. However, there are some studies underway. There's also different product, uh, a combination product that, that should hopefully make its way onto the market uh, by the end of the year. And so hopefully those patients will benefit from the direct-acting antiviral therapies as well. And lastly, the high cost of the new hepatitis C treatments is obviously causing a significant financial burden on our society. What are some of the strategies we can implement to make certain our limited resources are used wisely? I really think patient selection is key to this. We definitely want to make sure that the patients who we're starting on this treatment are going to be patients who adhere to therapy. Adherence is critical. So in my practice, I generally look for patients who are compliant with their other meds. They're avoiding alcohol and other illicit drugs. They have a reasonable life expectancy. I think in some resource-limited areas, some initial treatment priority may be given to patients who have more advanced liver disease. I think we as pharmacists certainly can play a role in uh, ensuring the patients adhere to the medications is, is critically important to the overall success of the treatment. Patient selection is certainly the biggest thing we can do to contain the cost of these medications. If you think about the natural course of hepatitis C, sort of at the 10,000-foot level, up to 80% of patients with chronic hepatitis C won't progress to cirrhosis and further to potential end-stage liver disease and, and associated complications. So if we treated every patient in the United States with Harvoni, we would probably bankrupt our healthcare system if everybody was treated. So picking those patients that have already progressed or are more likely to progress and prioritizing treatment for them is certainly an important consideration. I think coming up with treatment guidelines and algorithms is really important. The VA system has done an excellent job of coming up with fairly substantial guidelines for treatment, and I think that's also being done on a lot of state levels. I can speak to at least here in Maryland that treatment is reserved for patients that have a Medivir score of at least F2, demonstrating some degree of progression of their liver disease, which I personally agree with as a good starting point to really prioritize therapy for patients that need it most. But unfortunately, I think with the current price of these drugs being as extraordinary as they are, it's really hard to let as many people as you might want to have them have access to the drugs, and you have to prioritize the patients that will benefit most. Well, I want to thank again Dr. Heil and Dr. Love for their insight and commentary on the ION2 trial. Thank you. In summary, this trial suggests that lidipasvir sulfosfavir is a safe and effective therapy for patients with genotype 1 hepatitis C infection who have previously failed other treatment options. This trial reported some of the highest sustained virologic response rates for patients with genotype 1 infection and among those patients who are the most difficult to treat. What are your thoughts about the IN2 trial? How should the evidence be applied to patient care? We would love to hear your thoughts and welcome your comments. Thank you for viewing this panel discussion. This broadcast is brought to you by iForumRx, exploring the evidence that informs ambulatory care pharmacy practice. Thank you.